do you want to do? Ah, oh, that's great. <laughs> okay, let's begin. Okay, so um, last week, uh, uh, one of my clones showed up. Daniel showed up, and I know that I'll, I got so many great reviews from him, so I know that he did very well. Um, and hi, Daniel. And so he uh, sends his love and all the rest of that kind of thing. But I wanted to um, thank you for not freaking out about the fact that I wasn't able to be here. Uh, it was an uh, unexpected uh, problem, but it solved itself with Daniel showing up. And apparently, he did such a great job. I'm worried. <laughs> you all really loved him. Okay. Uh, but anyway. What I wanted to do today was um, kind of tie everything together. I was hoping that I would have the questions for the actual essays, uh, but I won't have them today. Um, I'm going to send them around to everybody, and I do expect everybody who's sitting in to give it a go, uh, and everyone who's taking it to give it a serious go. Um, so, um, you know, just see what you can do. They're, they're, um, just give it a go, see what you can come up with. Now, how far did you get in the last seminar? You got to, Daniel was introducing libidinal economy. So we were about the he talked about the tensor. He, he didn't talk about cake and theatrics or anything. Okay. Talk about MasterChef. Talk about MasterChef. So let's, first of all, I hope, I'm hoping that you read, reread, and read again the glossary, pagan theatrics, and the tensor. Because that, uh, sorry, and the great ephemeral skin. Um, pagan theatrics is in the great ephemeral skin, but we're going to go over this. Now, on the, on this electronic moment, I have, which apparently didn't work last week, which I think is bizarre, but anyway. Uh, we have this sentence. This is a sentence that um, Leotard, this is attributed to Leotard, maybe someone else has put it in there, but he didn't uh, give us the quote, but it's, who knows not how to hide, knows not how to love. And he quotes this a lot, and I, it ended up becoming a very important um, remark, I guess, um, for uh, many decades, actually, for many uh, students and uh, philosophers and artists and so on to get a sense of what that's saying. Who knows not how to hide, knows not how to love. So the question is, what does it mean to know? What does it mean to hide? What does it mean to love? Those are the things you need to think about when you're looking at that sentence. What does it mean to know? What does it mean to hide? What does it mean to love? For Leotard, one of the reasons I use libidinal economy uh, and, and therefore use, start off these uh, seminars with this remark so that you incorporate it to your mind, you tattoo it on your head, I don't care where you put it, um, you need to get a sense of why that is the basis of his um, sort of political philosophy <coughs> and also the question around what is art, and that for work around art that doesn't give one the ability to do that isn't working, isn't working as art. So again, we talked about that earlier in John's uh, thing today and um, a couple other people, but I often raise in the tutorials, what does it mean to have something work as a work of art? What does it mean to work as a work of art? So what does the word work mean in this thing? And part of that comes from Freud and the question of the work of mourning. Freud has an argument, which I'm going to draw into this today. Freud has an argument in his mourning and melancholia arguments where he says that melancholia is actually <coughs> unresolved mourning. M-O-U-R, mourning. Melancholia is unresolved mourning. And that those of you that continue to be repressed, not repressed, depressed, those of you that, all of us that are depressed, that group, the depressed crowd, part of that depression is linked, 
from a Freudian perspective, is linked to the inability to resolve melancholia. Melancholia comes when something you love is taken away. Notice I say taken away, I didn't say hide. Is dead, is killed, is prevented from you happening. Now that something could be yourself. You could be mourning the loss of yourself. You could be mourning the loss of your childhood. Let's say you didn't have one. Let's say you had a crummy one. So the mourning is something that, oh, sorry, the melancholia starts erupting when there is the inability to mourn. And what one does, according to not just Freud, but the basic positions on this, is you keep the object close to yourself. You keep the object of the thing that has died close to yourself. And so you can't resolve it. Because if you let go of it, goes your mind, thinking your mind. If you let go of the thing that you're keeping close, then you'll lose it forever. So the task is to keep the thing close. But to keep it close means you're always sad. You can't get over the melancholia. You have to, it's, it's a, you keep it alive by always mourning it. So it doesn't die. So you end up repeating the death of this, or the possible death, by keeping it close to you, by not letting go. So the work of mourning is to learn how to let go without killing it. That's a tough one. The work of mourning is how do you let go of something? Now I tell you this because the work of art is written in parallel, is written parallel to this kind of remark. You keep something close to you, let's say desire, or let's say whatever it is, and you need to figure out how to let it go enough that you don't lose it, but just that much that you're allowed to have a bit of distance. And what Leotard develops is the ability to hide it. To learn how to love, you need to not have something so close that, you know, you know when you first fall in love, everybody's, well, maybe not everybody's had the experience of falling in love, but let's pretend you have, you know. Um, or let's say you know somebody that's fallen in love, you know. They're insane. This is a form of psychosis. You know, you, you, you just can't be without the person. You're just thinking about them day and night, you know. You, 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 you're like this. There's no way, and so in a certain sense, that's not really loving. That's, I don't know, could be, depends on how they look. If they look just like yourself, that's a form of narcissism. If it looks like, you know, it's you know, some sort of, you know, interesting <coughs> lust. But the love requires an ability to let go without letting go so much that they go off somewhere, or not letting go enough that you, you can't be anything, you can't be yourself any longer. So, so learning how to love is this ability to let go just enough that it's out of sight, but not out of mind. Now, this thing that is out of sight, but not out of mind, the knowing, this thing that's out of sight, but not, but not out of knowing, not out of mind, mind in the whole physical body sense, this out of sight but not out of mind thing is something that one learns how to do. It is not something that you're, uh, that you're born with. Although, maybe I'm getting old enough to think, maybe you are, what's happening here? Please tell something about Sabbath before it goes crazy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> I was like, such a, it's a really intense thing. <laughs> Wait a second, technology. Okay. Um, this knowing is learned, but like I was saying, I'm getting old enough to think, you know, like for example, with all these terrible deaths that happened in these hospitals, how can you learn compassion? 
to me, it seems insane that if you saw someone elderly and incapable of eating, and the food is like four inches away and they can't reach it, that it doesn't occur to you to move the food closer, that you have to have a line item that says, be compassionate, tick. You know, like, did you, that, that seems like, so when I say learn, there is some sort of bottom line that it seems to me ought to be in the mix that you're not learning. That, or if you have to learn that one, that's kind of really pretty far down the food chain. So there's something else in there, because he's not saying, you know, you're born as a complete life blank thing and you just sort of fill it with stuff. He's saying that there's something that goes on in this thing that you need to figure out how to let go, but not so far let go that it goes off into some path, and not so close that you can't see it. And that is a form of a materiality that he is going to call the great ephemeral skin. That's your skin. So your skin is not literally that which is on your body, although it'll hurt just like it's on your body if someone took a knife and stabbed you. It's the relation between yourself and this love object that must hide. This forms the great skin, the great ephemeral skin. And it's this skin that he's very concerned about. Because it's this skin that he gets angry about that people don't seem to get when they talk about semiotics. Now, how many people have been introduced to this thing called semiotics? Has anybody heard this expression before, semiotics? Okay. When you become um, you know, more entrenched in your MA, uh, or for those of you that are finishing this year, when you, you know, graduate and become a PhD student, uh, you will become very familiar with the semiotics thing. Um, and in fact, it kind of harkens back to um, who is it that had the, uh, the 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 Nazi thing today? What was it? Tim. Tim. Yeah. Sorry. It it kind of harkens back to what we were doing um, earlier today in, in the first um, seminar. This this ability to understand where something has a materiality that is symbolic, a materiality that forms a metaphor. Um, is often put forward in terms of semi, is often put forward in terms of a thing called a sign, a signifier, and a signified. There's three parts, sign, signifier, and signified. Sign, S-I-G-N, then signifier, S-I-G-N-I-F-E, F-I-E-R, signifier, and signified. Now, I raise this in light of Tim's remarks today, because for those of you that weren't there at Tim's uh, thing, what he did, one of the things he did in part was have people standing under the arches outside in the lobby reading, not knowingly reading, Hitler's speech that, or not even a speech, actually, it was, a, it was a <coughs> passed by the, in Nuremberg, it was one of the laws passed against um, artists who tried to just do conceptual art. So anyone that did what was considered uh, the kind of work that Francesca does, or uh, the kind of work that um, um, uh, my head—who who does the? Uh, I can read his name now. Um, anyway, any work that was not typically landscape, traditional painting, that was a figural kind of painting, was considered well, a bad art. B bohemian. C ethnically challenged and uh, therefore all that. And so there were laws passed against conceptual art. And I think a reaction to this became a movement that was called semiotics or language and art. And it really took over the art schools, particularly in the 70s and 80s and 90s, so that at some point you weren't even allowed to use paint or, or watercolor or anything because the argument went to do so would put you back in this traditional Hitlerite environment. Careful. Um, <laughs> just crawl into the seminar once you hello. And there's a chair for you right there. Um, if that's going to blind you. Okay, so, so part of it was, so 
this. So you need to get a sense of the fact that semiotics and the whole tradition to which it's attached, which is called structuralism, makes up a radical left position against fascism, against the fascist move that required that one rejoice in art and that one learn very typical traditional notions of perspective, you know, like the kind of stuff that happens in the school, the kind of stuff that was happening all day to day. None of this would be considered art, including the thing that was happening with Tim. It would ju you know, just, would, there's just no way to understand it as anything called art. And, and the ability to allow that to happen in part came because of semiotics. So you need to understand the, the positive side of semiotics before I now trash it, along with um, Leotard. Because, <laughs> you know, that, you know, I can't help it. I haven't agreed with them on this. There became such a backlash, again, which, you know, is com completely understandable, that, you know, like our loving people like Roland Barthes, uh, like uh, Saussure, um, like uh, Roman Jacobson, um, anyway, the whole string of people. They're all involved in semiotics, Lacan, of course, being a big one. These are all semioticians who made the argument that language was the, the way in which one found the materiality of art. And uh, Leotard is having a big issue with this. And so you need to understand that the book is written in part in response to the semioticians who he hated. And also, he does say in the beginning, if you guys have a chance to read that, the, the foreword, which I didn't actually read, he basically says that he didn't know what he wanted to be when he grew up. He wanted to be many things. He wanted to be a monk. He wanted to be a practitioner. I forget where it says it here, but it's, it's actually quite funny. Um, and he basically becomes all, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Um, what's that? He yeah, he wants to be a painter. You know, you know, he, he wanted to be many things. He is it's really quite wonderful. Um, and in the end, he says, um, I, "But I became a. I en ended up becoming a philosopher." You know. Um, now, this he's haunted by these things. He's like, oh, he, uh, he wanted to become very political. Oh, I find it at some point. But anyway, you'll see it when you when you open the thing. The reason I tell you this is because he. Like many of us uh, who are committed to being political, to being um, you know philosophically grounded, to doing great artwork, you know whatever, being in the world, you know you get caught up in these movements. And uh, one of the movements was socialism and barbarism. It was, uh, sorry, it was called socialism or barbarism. That was the argument. Either you go for socialism, <coughs> or you're a jerk, you know, or you're barbaric, or you're a capitalist pig, basically. Either you're socialist, and he was involved with this group, but he found with that group that they were as, uh, let's say, um, draconian and authoritative as of any of the other groups he was involved with. And it was very annoying. So his liberal economy book, he, oh, well, wait a minute. Then he also tries to become a monk. He's very, uh, he, you know, and he can't stand the authoritarian positions around this, so this is this, this is all disillusioning. It's all one big disillusionment. You know, it's like I say, you know, be careful when you meet your heroes. It can be very disillusioning. You know, um, so he goes to meet, you know, he goes to do the great thing and he fails. Or, or he doesn't fail, he, the movements fail him. For those of you that, you know, I don't know how many people have ever been involved politically in movements. You know, I was involved, uh, well, I still am involved, you know, in terms of uh, on, the, on the left, when many years ago I was um, involved with getting, I think I might have mentioned this, I was getting people out of concentration camps in Chile. And we had to work on the ground about this. And one of the people that worked on the ground in this situation uh, was in a car with the ambassador from Chile, Orlando Letelier, and was blown up in that car, which was quite a little bit of an eye opener for me because I'd never known anybody that was actually killed in a car bomb, so you can imagine. And um, this group I was involved with, this kind of cell group, we all got together, all freaked out, and so they said to me, you know, they had different tasks, and they said to me, my task was to check for bombs uh, with people coming into the church, if, you know, to say, give their, you know, say they're sorry, and I was like, and what if I find a bomb? You know, what am I supposed to say, don't bring it in? <laughs> like, sorry, that's, we're not allowing that in. Like, you know, it's like no backup plan. You know, so I thought to myself, okay, disillusionment, you know, like, you know, Wow, that's kind of incredible. Like, you know, they say, like, well, you know, 
you just you know, just make them go away. It was like, <laughs> uh huh, okay, that's not working for me, you know. So these are the kind of examples I give you. Or I even gave this example earlier today, uh, but I don't think people heard it. In the uh, one of the military approaches to getting people to um, to understand the role of uh, how wonderful the U.S. military was is that the U.S. military came up with this brilliant idea of dropping uh, leaflets over Nicaragua, telling them how terrible and fascist the um, the people they were fighting, you know, the, the whatever the Sandinistas were, um, this kind of thing. Except they had it all in English. Fantastic. So no one could read it. Of course, also most of the people couldn't read anyway. So I mean, the whole thing was like 2,000 pamphlets came down on your plantation. Can you imagine? And all they can see is that it's written in English. So it's obviously American. Some American idiot has just dropped 2,000 pamphlets on your farm land that you're trying to plow. You know, so now you got to pick all the stuff up. Okay, so I tell you all this because what Leotard, he, he's going through the same kind of thing, and he gets a disillusion. And so the Libidinal Economy book is what he calls his great fuck you book. It's, it's his fuck you book, and literally he calls it this. It's your fuck you book to all the groups he can't stand. He can't stand the leftists any longer. He can't stand the semioticians. He can't stand the artist. He can't stand anybody. And, and, and so he's saying, okay, here, here's where we're at. I don't know what else to say. So this is what I can tell you that I get that we got to steal from the various houses that I've been at. So the first thing I go back to, he steals the hiding. He steals this thing called hiding. And what he's doing with the hiding is he's allowing desire, sexualness, orgasm, fucking, sweat, to never leave the art world. He demands that it stay in art. And if it doesn't stay in art, it's not his art. It's not his revolution. If somehow the art is orchestrated in such a way that it doesn't sweat, and we'll get into what that means, because obviously we're talking about painting, or we're talking about uh, you know, film, or we're talking about you know, a novel. It's not like the thing is actually sitting there sweating. So, it's, or, 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 or having multiple orgasms. He's not talking about it like that. So, so he's, he's, he's saying something that I need you to hear, but at the time, for the time being, just try and get down this notion of the sweating, <clears throat> the, the, the sexual, that this is somehow embedded in the surface. This is part of the hiding, or later we'll see part of the hide. And you have the slippage between hiding, I-N-G, and hide, as in skin. So hiding as in hide, and hiding as in skin. Or hide as in <coughs> peekaboo, hide, and hide as in skin. So that's the second thing you need to know. The first was this notion of melancholy, this notion <coughs> of, of the sadness, that you, that you keep your sadness, you keep your depression next to you, because it's comforting, actually. Because at the end of the day, to let go of your depression is more scary. And, and a lot of times people are depressed, not because they're like consciously, I want to keep my depression, you know, so go fuck off, you know, and I'm happy with my depression. So if you're depressed, you're depressed. You know, you're not like sitting there saying to yourself, I so the knowing of the depression is not the same as a rational knowing. It's a body knowing. So he's going to get into a very different sense of knowledge here. It's a different form of knowing. And he's annoyed with the Hegelians of the world who have infiltrated the socialism camp. And it's, it's got the socialism or barbarism thing. Next. So the, the first is the knowing not to hide is knowing not. The second is this whole is the melancholy and the sadness thing, and, and next, close to that is this question of hiding and the hide, the ephemeral skin. And he talks about the great concentrati, concentratory, he makes up those words, it's annoying, it's concentratory zero, concentrated zero. The great, we'll just kind of call it concentrated zero, but you'll see that it's spelled 
with T O R Y on the end, concentratory, concentrated, tape off the E D, and O R Y, concentratory. He's made up this word. Um, so it doesn't work in French and it doesn't work in English either. But anyway, basically, it's this notion of how something can concentrate mm -hmm. the orgasmic, the wild, the, the transgressive that must be a part of art, that's going to be written out of the art books if the fascists have anything to say about it. Which is why I liked your comment today, Tina. Which one? The one about Goebbels. I thought, did you make that comment? You did. You, did you say something about Goebbels? About Tim's thing? I said about church. I don't remember what I said. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I remember. That's enough. Okay. I remember completely different one. Um, okay. So now the next thing, I'm just going to lay this out so then we can go into the thing. The next thing you need to understand is what this concentrated zero, the great, calls it the great concent well, concentratory zero. It has to do with the way in which something that has no weight, no volume, no nothing, creates or is the expression of sexualness. And he's going to call that pagan theatrics. It's a shame that um, Yvonne isn't here today. Where is Yvonne? Anybody know? Maybe be into this thing. It's the, it's the, uh, so pagan theatrics. What, what is paganism? Does anybody know? Pre-Christian religion. Yeah, and what is that? What is they, it? Uh, they had a passion for <coughs> images. Uh, they believed uh, that the idol was something as a god. Uh, yeah, so you pray to the lamb was, or whatever yeah. it was, yeah. So that's one thing. What else? What does pagan bring up in your mind? If you were like to do like word association, what does it bring up in your mind? Pagan tattoos. Tattoos. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And what does that bring up in your mind? I'm be careful with words, but tribal. Tribal. But yeah. Tribal is a contested word. Yeah, that's right. What is what does pagan mean for you? Druids. Uh, Druids. And what, what does I'm druid thinking, mean? Thinking of worshipping a probably um it's the um, sort of god in everything, but it kind of links to that partially. Because um, if we're not clear about this pagan thing, we can you, you know Mother Earth. It's Mother Earth, yeah, Gaia, you could say, you know. But but what what does it mean to say I want to put paganism on the table here? The prophet, is it? What's that? Is it the word profane? Or profane. Profane. Yes. Yeah. And what is like, profane? Well, it's like the same thing we were talking about when you said art must be dirty. And I think it's the same thing, but with, uh, I would say, religion maybe. Has anybody ever heard of Bacchus? B A Bacchus and Bacchanalian. Yeah. What is that, John? That's um, the Greek god. And who, who, what did Bacchus do? Had something to do with life and equality and plus and roles and such. Yeah. And who fought, what happened in Bacchanalian moments? Um, it's orgies. Orgies, hello! <laughs> yes, orgies, anything else? Drinking. Drinking. Drugs. Drugs. Sex. Sex. Animals were in bestiality. Bestiality? <laughs> Are you glad you came tonight? Uh, Hiram and Bosch, what? The sacred and the profane all together. Yep. Sacred. The sacred and the profane all together, yes. Anything else? I want you to understand who we're dealing with here. We're not talking about somebody who is trying to write about something really nice, neat, and tidy here. It's not Christian. It's not Christian. <laughs> it's really not Christian. <laughs> it's really not Christian. What's that? Sacrifices. Sacrifices. Blood. Blood. Is it kind of like abandoning what you think you should do and letting another part of you go a bit crazy? Mm -hmm. A bit wild. A bit wild. Or enjoying yourself? Mm -hmm. Okay. And <laughs> so it's so deadpan. <laughs> <laughs> Joint. So, has anybody ever known of anyone? 
we don't want to embarrass anyone, <coughs> who's gone somewhere on a beach in the night, stripped off, and had wild sex. Dang, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> if not, <laughs> think about it. It's a homework assignment, okay? <laughs> We're in the Midlands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the good news and the bad news. You can always go to LA Fitness. <laughs> anyway. Um, some Bikram yoga. What's that? Some Bikram yoga. I see. Yes. Well, actually, that's a different. So, so we're going to get the. We're going to. So, are we ready now to actually begin to understand what we're dealing with here? So, the borders are corrupted. But remember that something is being hidden. So, it's not just the wild bacchanalian moment. Remember, as artists or as philosophers, or as art philosophers, or whatever you are, you know, um, you must learn how to do both without becoming sort of either too sterile or too dirty, in a certain sense, because it won't work. There has to be some kind of relation. And he's going to call that relation a libidinal economy. Note the title of the book. <laughs> a bit like economy. So, it's a very, it's an economy. What, what does the word economy actually mean? It means that it's a shorthand. If you're being economic with the truth, or if you're accusing someone of being economic with the truth, basically they're telling the truth, you know, but they're not telling the whole <coughs> truth. It means being economical. So, if it's said a certain way, and a very short version of it, then you're going to get just that little bit. So an economy, the word economy means the way in which one can shorten or create some kind of system. So a shorthand. It's a shorthand for something. So libidinal economy is the name of the process that you need to figure out how to do that creates this ability to have, not on the one hand, rationality, on the other hand, bacchanalian, but that they're together. And so one of the things that you may have noticed in his work is that he also goes on a rabid attack of Heidegger. So he's attacking Adorno. He's attacking Hegel. He's attack and these are all different. We've, we've all different footnotes we've done throughout the year. So Hegel should bring up the notion of dialectics, and he's attacking that. Adorno is trying to talk about the ethics of the revolution and the importance of you know uh, how you get a revolutionary environment going. And I mean Adorno is a very cr critical thinker, and he's like. Adorno is problematic. He's got problems with Heidegger's notion of difference, which we were going banging on again about for quite some time, which I'm going to go over again shortly. And he's having problems with um, semioticians. So, but he's stealing from them little bits. And so the third thing you need to remember in noting this thing about the libidinal economy, the way in which this materiality gets established. <laughs> this materiality that is something that you're going to use. It's not on the one hand sex, on the other hand no sex. On the one hand, you know, you're having orgasms every five seconds. On the other hand, you know, you're a monk. It's not set up like that. It, they're, they're in, there's no outside to what he's saying. There's no inside to what he's saying. There's simply an economy. You've got to get rid of inside and outside. But if you've got to keep it just for the time being so you learn what he's saying, you're in the inside. That, that there's just no outside. You're on the band. You're on the libidinal band. Now, so he starts developing this in his argument. And the first thing he says is learn the glossary. 
which is why the glossary is at the front of the book. And this is, we're going to go through it in a minute. This glossary is kind of weird. It's got things like one word you need to learn is called dispositif. D-I-S-P-O-S, dispositif, -I -I dispositif, D-I-S-P-O-S, T-I-F. <laughs> the next one you need to know is the concentratory zero. And the third one you need to understand is the tensor band, which I, I take it that Daniel beat home, but we're going to go over it anyway. So those are the three main ones, and then there's little ones that come up, like little legs to the, you know what a jellyfish looks like? So picture these little legs hanging down. So the blob is going to be your, your libidinal economy. And the little things hanging off of it are the, are the kind of entities. Think of it backwards. Don't think of it the legs hanging down from the blob, but the legs are sort of supporting the blob, but not like a sta not like stool, not like a legs to a chair. There's no ground. But they're just giving the blob its light, its energy. And in fact, those legs aren't outside the blob. They're not really underneath the blob. The blob could be like that, right? So, so you're being asked to think in different dimension here. Always circle back to who knows not how to hide, knows not how to love. This is the, the, the we're asking you to, the, me and Vita, are asking you to understand how to know something. Now, the word no. Anybody a Bible scholar? Well, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to know that the word no, in biblical sense, doesn't just mean reading a book. What does it mean to know somebody in the Bible? To be one with them. What does it mean to be one with them? <laughs> to be sexual. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, to be sexual active, to be sexual, to know. So knowledge, real knowledge, isn't just being an intellectual. It's being an intellectual sexual. And an intellectual sexual is an artist. So again, so, so intellectual sexual, not, not a sexual intellectual, that's something different. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't. Don't. What? Sorry, buddy. I'll run with it. Okay. <laughs> now, if you point out Dane one more time, <laughs> it's going to come back then. Um, okay, so, so we. We're not yet, you know, full yet on the notion of the pagan. And I meant to bring, actually, I'm sorry about this, but I meant to bring wine tonight. Does anybody have wine on them? <laughs> no, not just on you. <laughs> okay, because I did have some in there. And I, um, I, um, anyway, um, I took it, I took, I put it all somewhere else, and I don't have to back anyway. But anyway, pretend we're drinking wine. Sorry about that. You can have an orange. You know, that'll, that'll have to work for the time being. Um, it's important that you realize that you need to learn how to be loose. That you need to know the discipline of being loose. You need to loosen up. Even Nietzsche says this, Nietzsche being, I think, the first real philosopher of art. Nietzsche basically says, you know, if you squint too hard when you're trying to understand philosophy, you'll never get it. No. You need to be loose. You need to let it kind of come to you, and you need to go to it. So this is, again, this Heideggerian move of bringing forth or being pulled and pulling back. Okay. So the three things that underwrite this book, Libidinal Economy, or the three things that underwrite Libidinal Economy, the three things that, when I say under right, I don't mean underneath it. I mean like the legs of the jellyfish, 
which is a great expression, jellyfish, since it's not really a fish. But anyway, <laughs> um, that just is an aside. Have you ever swum with jellyfish? Mm -hmm. not, not good, mm -hmm. bad. Very bad. I was swimming um, in, off of this island in off Napoli, uh, and I was being really, you know, I thought I was being really challenging and rebel and stuff like this. Um, so I was basically mm -hmm. naked, and I was wearing a jock strap hello, um, and a, um, and, uh, you know, there's no accounting for taste, even then. Not, it wasn't even working then, you know. Anyway, um, and I had on a scuba equipment. And I had on a snorkel. And I was snorkeling around, going la la la, and I'm fantastic and you know brave and really avant-garde. And I saw all this plastic stuff in the water. And I thought to myself, you know, what slob has like dumped all this plastic? And there was a big black plastic bag, you know. And I was like, I'm getting closer. I'm thinking, why is that bag floating in the middle of the water and not resting on top or falling down? And why are all those little plastic pieces that are around me? Flowing. Oh my goodness, that's a big squid. <laughs> and those are little things like jellyfish. And I made it to the um, to the side of the thing in record time. I want you to know. I, I felt like an idiot. I was completely burned and you know, bitten and you know, the white, you know, it, was, it was very unfun. Very unfun. Anyway, I tell you this because the image of the jellyfish is burned in my head. But because I am... Sandy Fish is probably telling exactly the same story. <laughs> That's right. Woman in a shock <laughs> stress. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Very possible. Although I have to think that the man of war squid ate that particular, you know, what goes around comes around. Anyway, um, I had a lot of interruptions with animals. I mean, I was also snorkeling in uh, Mexico. I mean, obviously, it's not something I should be doing very often. Uh, and I was with barracuda. And I never knew that they were dangerous until then. And I was making faces at them, <laughs> like you do. And, and people were like, get out of the water. I was like, and they're like, <laughs> it's like, anyway, sorry. That was it not. Works. It works. Yeah. Well, they didn't, I, they obviously either accepted me as a very odd looking barracuda, you know, uh, or, you know, whatever. They didn't bother me, you know, and I got out. I was like, well, they were weird, you know, yeah, they're ugly, <laughs> like, you know, bulldogs and but long. You know, um, anyway, uh, I'll, bring, I'll bring in more animal stories as they come to me. But, um, but that is only to say that the jellyfish thing is an interesting surface because its legs aren't really legs, but they are. So these concepts I'm trying to get you to think about, the, the great zero, the ephemeral skin, the tensor band, these are both legs of the libidinal economy, and they form the economy. So are we OK with that? Because I'm going to move on from that. OK. Now, what, what um, libidinal economy tries to do, or what he tries to do, is he says that he wants to create a perverse a polymorphously perverse um, notion of investment in, in knowing who we are. So following Freud, Freud makes the argument. So he both loves and hates Freud, so, as most people do at this point. He basically, Freud makes the argument, as you may know, that everyone is born polymorphously perverse. You start off this way. You're not born. Uh, you know, like uh, heterosexual or gay or whatever. You're born, everyone is born mm -hmm. polymorphously perverse. And the reason is poly, what does the word poly mean? Tanya? Not poly. Yeah, good, see, that's the right accent. <laughs> no, no, yeah. I would just. Like, yes, that's it, poly. Means a lot. It means a lot, means, so, means something more than one, right? Something more than two, even. Yeah. Something more than three. <laughs> How many more? <laughs> many more. <laughs> okay, just so you know how many perversions can fit on the head of a pen. A lot, as it turns out. You know, and that's what um, that's what Leotard's talking about. He's talking about 
I'm not talking about angels here, I'm talking about perversions. And what does it mean to talk about a perversion? What, what, is, per, what is perverse? Non-normative. Non-normative, good. Okay, and what is that? Why, why is he celebrating this? This is the question. Why is this? Because it's breaking out of the norms. And why does it, if you're born polymorphously, mm -hmm. yeah, perfect. No, you're right, you're right, it is breaking out. But why, why is that important? Well, if you're born like, if everybody's born like that, that means it's inherent in everybody. So it depends how you have been conditioned. And then it's, if you break out of this being conditioned and actually access something that you have in you anyway. Yes. So it's like touching a, a ground. You know? Yeah, but it's touching the ground that is no ground. Yeah. Just remember that. Mm -hmm. This is the jellyfish ground. Yeah. Right? Okay, so there's no ground to the ground. Mm -hmm. Do you remember, this is how Heidegger develops the argument, even though he's against Heidegger. Mm -hmm. You know, this relation between Dasein and being. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, now, I just want to turn to chapter one, whatever it is, and then we'll go. <coughs> um, Grace, can I ask you to put chapter one, just the opening part of chapter one on there? So I'm not... I'm not going to do the. Um, <coughs> okay, which says it starts out the great ephemeral skin. By the way, if you go on ARG, this book is on ARG. Um, you want to go to page nine, I think it is, or no, page one. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I know it's, it's horrible. I'm making you do it because it's just awful. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Okay. Almost there. Ah, there you go. A little bit higher. A little bit lower. That's good. Right. Now, Luke, you seem like the right person to read this out loud. Okay, so if you could read out that paragraph and read it not deadbeat, but really read it. You want to miss grammar and finesse a little further? This is what? Miss grammar and finesse and finesse. You're going to be all right. Open the so-called body and spread out all its surfaces. Not only the skin with each of its folds, wrinkles, scars, with its great velvety planes, and uh, con contiguous. contiguous to that, the scalp, its mare of hair, the tender public fur. No, pubic. <laughs> pubic fur, public fur. <laughs> you did have an interesting weekend, didn't you? <laughs> Start again. From the song? Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> oh boy, sorry everyone. <laughs> Open the so-called body and spread out all its surfaces. Not only the skin with each of its folds, wrinkles, scars, and its great velvety planes, and contiguous to that, the scalp its, uh, and its mane of hair, the tender pubic fur, nipples, nails, hard transparent skin under the heel, the light, uh, the fr light frills of the eyelids set with the lashes, but open and spread, expose the labia ma majora, so that the labia minora, with their blue network bathed in mucus, dilate the diaphragm of the anal syntha, the syntha, sphincter, 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 asshole. <laughs> 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 sorry, I'm trying. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way. Though. Wait, wait, wait. Dilate the uh, diaphragm of the anal. Long, long, Does anybody want to try that word? Stinkter. Yeah. Stinkter. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm going to haunt my dreams. <laughs> Lots of people shouting. Uh, at me. Longitudinally cut and flatten out the black conduit of the rectum, then the colon, then the caseum. Uh, caseum. Now a ribbon with its surface all striated and polluted with shit, as though your dressmaker's scissors were opening the leg of an old pair of trousers. Go on, expose the small intestines, 
alleged in Syria that Jing, you know, man, Jing Dung <laughs> did you? Didn't thank you, Dan. I feel so bad. Good. Keep going. The um, the the, the uh, uh, Liam. 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 Um, the Don Judeo. Judeo. I should have done biology. Uh, or else, um, at the other end, undo the mouth at its corners, pull out the tongue at its most distant roots, and split it. Spread out the bat's wings, uh, bats' wings of the pallet and uh, damp basements. Open the trachea and make uh, it the skeleton of the boat under the construction. Armed with scalpels and tweezers, dismantle, lay out the bundles and bodies of the encephalon. What is that? <coughs> That's brain. 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 In, uh, of encephalon, and then the whole network of veins and arteries intact, intact on, the immense, uh, on the immense mattress, and then the lymphatic network and the fine bony pieces of the wrists, the ankle, take them apart and put them end to end with all the layers of nerve tissue which surround the aqueous humerus, humors and the uh, cavernous body of the penis, and extract the great muscles, the great dorsal nets, spread them out like smooth sleeping dolphins, work as the sun does, but when you're sun uh, but when you're sunbathing or taking grass. Okay. Can we go back to the top? Thanks. That's good. <coughs> Stuart, you want to give it a go? That whole section, yeah. <laughs> now when you hear this, not that everybody's gonna go around reading this, okay. When you hear it this time and try and read it with, you know, the same kind of panache, that's good. Uh, ask yourself the question, why is this opening a book in philosophy? This is a murderous, nasty, not good, immoral thing that we're reading. I want to mention that. Okay, go on, Stuart. <laughs> 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 Open the so-called body and spread out all its surfaces. Slow, slow, slow. Try again. Uh, right. And, and, and can you also mention the, 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 the title and then the next thing? Okay. The great cool. ephemeral skin. So that's what we're talking about. Opening the libidinal surface. Open the so-called body and spread out all its surfaces, not only the skin with each of its folds, wrinkles, scars, with its great velvety planes, and contiguous to that, its scalp <coughs> and its mane of hair, the tender pubic fur, nipples, nails, mm -hmm. hard transparent skin under the heel, the light frills of the eyelids set with lashes. But open and spread, expose the labia majora, so also the labia minora with their blue network bathed in mucus, dilate the diaphragm of the anal sphincter, longitudinally cut and flatten out the black conduits of the rectum, then the colon, then the is, it, is that the sacrum? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now a ribbon with its surface all striated and polluted with shit, as though your dressmaker's scissors were opening the leg of an old pair of trousers. Go on, expose the small intestines alleged interior, the jejunum, the jejunum, the ileum, the duodenum, or else at the other end, undo the mouth at its corners, pull out the tongue at its most distant roots and split it. Spread out the bat's wings of the pallet in its damp basement. Open the trachea and make it the skeleton of the boat under construction. Armed with scalpels and tweezers, tweezers, dismantle and lay out the bundles and bodies of the encephalon, and then the whole network of veins and arteries intact on an immense mattress, and then the lymphatic network and the fine bony pieces of the wrist, the ankle. Take them apart and put them end to end with all the layers of nerve tissue which surround the aqueous humors and the cavernous bodies of the penis, and extract the great muscles the great dorsal nets spread them out like smooth sleeping dolphins. Work as the sun does when you're sunbathing or taking grass. I.e. taking grass, not laying on it. Okay, we're going to do it one more time. This time, if you can close your eyes, everyone close your eyes, and I want you to try and remember what it is you're hearing. I'm going to read it out loud. Okay, so, so just, just close your eyes, everyone close your eyes. Close your eyes. <laughs> eyes closed. Everybody got eyes closed? Eyes closed mean eyes closed, yes. 
in a relaxed sort of way. You don't have to like be squinting. The great femoral skin opening the libidinal surface. Open the so-called body and spread out all of its surfaces, not only the skin with each of its folds, wrinkles, scars, with its velvety planes and contiguous to that, the scalp and its mane of hair, the tender pubic fur, nipples, nails, hard transparent skin under the heel, the light frills of the eyelids, the light frills of the eyelids, set with lashes that open and spread. Expose the labia majora, so also the labia minora, with their blue network bathed in mucus. Dilate the diaphragm of the anal sphincter, longitudinally cut, and flatten out the black conduit of the rectum, then the colon, then the casum, now a ribbon, with its surface, now a ribbon with its surface, now a ribbon with its surface, all striated and polluted with shit, as though your dressmaker's scissors were opening the leg of an old pair of trousers. Go on, expose the small intestines, do not be afraid. Expose the small intestines, alleged interior, the jejunum, the ileum, the duodenum, or else at the other end, undo the mouth at its corners. Undo the mouth at its corners. Pull out the tongue at its most distant roots and split it. Spread out the bat's wings of the palate and its damp basements. Open the trachea and make it the skeleton of a boat under construction armed with scalpels and tweezers, dismantle and lay out the bundles and bodies of the encephalon, and then the whole network of veins and arteries intact on an immense mattress, and then the lymphatic network and the fine bony pieces of the wrist, your wrist, the ankle, your ankle. Take them apart and put them end to end with all the layers of nerve tissue which surround the aqueous humors and the cavernous body of the penis. And extract the great muscles, the great dorsal nets, spread out like smooth, smooth sleeping dolphins. Work as the sun does when you're sunbathing or taking grass. And this is not all, far from it. Connected onto these lips, a second mouth is necessary. A third, a great number of mouths, vulvas, nipples, and adjoining the skin of the fingertips, scraped by the nails. Perhaps there should be a, a huge silken beaches of skin taken from the inside of the thighs, the base of the neck, or from the strings of a guitar. And against the palm, all latticed with nerves, increased like a yellow leaf, set potter's clays, or even hard wooden handles encrusted with jewels, or a steering wheel, or a drifter's sail, something like that is perhaps required. Don't forget to add the tongue, your tongue, and all the pieces of the vocal apparatus, all the sounds of which, are cap of which you are capable, and moreover, the whole selective network of sounds, that is, the phonological system, where this too belongs to the libidinal body, like colors that must be added to retinas, like certain particles to the epidermis, like some particularly favored smells to the nasal cavities, like preferred words and syntaxes to the mouths which utter them and to the hands which write them down. It is not enough, you see, to say that the fold in the armpit of the child dreamily intent, her elbow on the table and chin in her hand could count as the folds of her groin, or even as the juncture of the lips of her sex, the question of counting as, don't urge us to ask it, far less to resolve it. It is not a part of the body, of what body? Of the organic body, organized with survival as its goal against what excites it to death, assured against riot and agitation, not a part which comes to be substituted for another part, not a part which comes to be substituted for another part, like, for example, in the case of this little girl, the fleshiness of the arm for that of the thighs and its faint fold for the vaginal slit. 
It is not this displacement of parts recognizable in the or organic body of the political economy, itself initially assembled from differentiated and appropriated parts, the latter never being without the former that we first need to consider. Such displacement, whose function is representation, substitution, presupposes a bodily unit upon which is inscribed through transgression. There is no need to begin with transgression. We must go immediately to the very limits of cruelty. We must perform the dissection of the polymorphous perverse, spread it out, spread out the immense membrane of the libidinal body, which is quite different to a frame. It is made from the most heterogeneous textures of bone, epithelium, sheets to write on, charged atmospheres, swords, glass cases, peoples, grasses, canvases to paint. All these zones, all these zones are joined end to end in a band which has no back to it. It is a mobus band which, in, in, which interests us not because it is closed, but because it is one-sided, a mobian skin which rather than being smooth is on the contrary, is this topologically possible, it's on the contrary covered with roughness, corners, creases, cavities, which when passes on the first turn will themselves turn into cavities. But as for what it turns the band on, no one knows, nor will you know, in the eternal term. The interminable band with this variable geometry where nothing requires that it is an excavation remains concave, besides it is inevitably convex on the second turn, provided it last, has not yet got two sides. It's only got one side, and therefore neither exterior nor interior. Okay, open your What would you hear? He's protesting against Hegel. And quite a quite the protest. <laughs> and how is he doing so? Um, by discussing this idea of the layers that the nerve endings and the kind of sensual nature of perhaps what drives us everything, and, it, it, and that that should be first. So he kind of opens out the body. It's a female body. The start, it's, yeah. Um, then he ends up with the male body. Yeah, but it's mostly a female body. Yeah. It's mostly preoccupied with that. Yeah. Because I think that's the most taboo. Yeah. Perhaps. It's certainly taboo, although it does tend to be the female body that always gets the vessel question. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> what did other people think? No, it's important too. What do you think? Um, oh, it's you. It's <laughs> not. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm trying to grasp what he was talking about. Um, he's setting up this this Mobius strip of these body parts uh, that are neither inside nor outside. Um, he seems to put them together in a in a way that has no direct relation to each other. He seems to uh, I don't know. He talks about the strip spinning and kind of the bumps and the grooves kind of evening out and it becoming a smooth thing. Yeah, I call I picked on you. I didn't call on you, but I picked on you because you didn't hear the first set of lectures in the first semester. Mm. So I wanted to see if you had not heard anything about Hegel, which you heard, which is fine, which is good, um, how you would hear this. Mr. Sure would you hear? I was probably taking quite literally but I think in terms of that literally removing the inside outside thing, you you you're exposing everything to the air, but you're not how, how we experience how we're being in the world. It's not a, there's not a separation. To, it's just opening everything out, so if everything is open or, or all close, but it, it's neither mm -hmm. in, that, in that sense. So it's kind of probably think of being, you know, physically experience of being in the world. It's that every little passage inside the body mm -hmm. becomes. Inhabited by, by the air around us rather than having rather than having inside this outside. Okay. <clears throat> what do you think that's vision? Um I also was thinking that when you're reading like spinning the body 
So you were the opened up thing. that it was their body, or most people thought they were doing the dissecting, or most people thought both. That's true. What you said about um, this is what the artist does, that's why I was choosing to think this is about me, this is about trying to make myself up. Open yourself up. Yeah. Okay. And not open that's up that's somebody that's else. <laughs> not open up, not go and no, open up. There's, no, there's a murder. There's not a murder. Yeah. You're the mur you're, you're being the murderer and the murderee. Okay. Oh, that's not right. The, the, the victim and the, yeah, the subject and the object. Great. When you think about the crash of J.G. Bell. Mm -hmm. In what way? Um, in this sort of... I mean, J.G. Bell is definitely taking off on this. Right, okay. And just the fact that the body is just a, a scene of any kind of pleasure that it means to be in any orifice, even if that's been caused by technology and accident. It just made me think about mm -hmm. that kind of power. I mean, on top of what people have said, because I was thinking about that thing, it also made me think about it. Yeah, so? I thought, of course, of many bodies being like torn apart, mm -hmm. but then I thought that somehow they got together and they became what they were. They became what they were, meaning already back? Not the, exactly how they were before. Somehow, like this, all these parts found another part from another part and and made something new. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Like a reward, <coughs> but in another way. Okay, we're getting we're getting warmer ish. I didn't see violence in it. You said no. that murder. Yeah. I, I didn't see it, even though it's no. I didn't see that. Even though it was like ripping and well, tearing and <laughs> talking about cruelty and Yeah. <coughs> did you th see it as being in it um, can you just get that Wow. Well, is it that truth of the body, the materiality of it? You just cannot get away from it. This is what we've got. That's it. Yeah, yeah. This is the truth. That's where the truth begins and ends, is with us. And our bodies, and without words, without language, without anything else, we will shit, we will eat, we will follow us. That's the end of it all. I think that's a good, good place to at least put a marker down. Sarah? Yeah, I was just thinking of, um, <coughs> is there a bit further on in the text where he's talking about holes in the body? Mm -hmm. And this is just getting rid of the holes. And the holes mm -hmm. are the bits that define us, that define them. And also are that they're the places to which get most damaged. What Christian was saying was that, you know, that even if you add in penises and whatnot, it's still talking about using woman as the example, right? That's what you're getting at, right? Or no? That's how, uh, yeah, I felt, I felt that. Yeah. No, not, not, ne not necessarily in a critical way of him, but in any way, but I think that he's, Yeah, the body is political, and and art is political, even the most banal art, or it, not, not the most terrible art. No, if it works as art, it's going to be political. Now, whether or not it's going to overthrow a country, that's a different issue. That's a different level, a different type of political. 
but it's, yes, that's good. That's why I wanted to come back to what you're saying. And that's why he's angry at Hegel. You are very sharp to have seen that, to see that way in which he's, but, but he's, he's saying if you follow the Hegelian model, it's fabulous, except you're just not going to understand that where this where this viscerality goes? What, what you you read it twice? And then what did you think about that? Oh, I was thinking about uh, Frank Ovid. And yeah, what uh, about Frank Ovid? Images of war. Yeah. So images from war. Seeing a guy getting his head blown off. Yeah. Is beautiful aesthetically. The composition of seeing the skin explode. <laughs> <and> <laughs> But the, the image of seeing the head explode aesthetically is very beautiful, but as soon as we say, oh, that's exploding head, it becomes something very uncomfortable. With this, <coughs> there was an irony in the fact that um, it can only be achieved through text on a living body. Dissection only happens on a dead body. There's no way for that body to, um, a couple of words, exist, be in the world. Dissected. Dissected. It has but didn't to you say be. that you felt dissected? And you felt dissected. Did anybody else feel dissected? But how can we so, feel? So we have three people at least feeling dissected. But how does that feel, considering you can feel that, but in a bipedal body that's still whole? You're projecting, a, 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 I'm not um, saying that you're feeling being dissected is invalid, but you're projecting you're saying that. a... <laughs> no, you're saying something uh, you're saying it's wrong. You're projecting what that may feel like, but you can never know, unless I lay you out right now, I'm going to get a scalpel out. That would feel nice. Couldn't tell you that. I was just trying to imagine how it would be. I, I know it can't be because but I couldn't talk to you and say how it feels. That's a purely aesthetic experience, minus sensual the senses such as pain. Anybody want to respond to Luke's challenge? Because that would take over. I don't think it necessarily all of us need to have actually the, uh, we don't need to be dissected to to imagine what it can do to you. In some ways, I don't think it. You know, in order to, uh, in a medical sense, yes. In order to understand that, yes. But I think in a creative, imaginative sense, I think as uh, Anastasia was saying, really, you know, she felt her body was dissected in some ways, and she tried to understand that quality. So it puts you on a different plane, doesn't it? It's that creative thought aspect of trying to grasp and look. Is possible with our body. Yeah, because you know how the pain feels, even if it's not physical pain. You know how pain feels, I think everyone knows that. So I guess you can imagine how probably it would be. You hit your leg and you even, even once. But so this is a man who's got problems with semiotics and words, and yet using words <coughs> to induce these feelings. Seems ironic to me personally. Sarah? I was just thinking, I saw a Paul Arrega exhibition. And there's a Paul Arrega? Yeah. yeah. It's on there. And there's an Where? At the Nuns on the Alright. Um, oh, okay. There's an image of a woman on the sofa. She's on the sofa. And there's a man behind her. And it's called Flay. And he's cutting on the skin off her back. She's just kind of going, okay. Yep. You know, like, get on with it. And I was just thinking of, I, you know, I just, it was just a thought mm -hmm. of how you could imagine, you know, we've all, we've all cut our skin, we all know how that, that's so, 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 so the, the title of this piece was what? What was the title of, I mean, not the Great Ephemeral Skin, what was the second oh, title? Opening the Surface. Opening the Libidinal Surface. So he, you know, he has to talk in words because he can't, you know, if one's challenging semiotics, that doesn't mean that you can't then use language. He's challenging semiotics because he's challenging the notion of representation, that you use something to stand in for something else. So you use the elbow, as you were saying, to stand in for the labia. But if you actually are dealing with labia, it, it, when you realize the viscerality of it and the political 
connotations by literally saying that and, and, and being enveloped in this or being expressed by it, then you have a different um, sense of how your um, ground, which is in fact the surface, operates. Because the surface now is no longer this kind of imminent transcendental move that Hegel was talking about all the time, or even to lose Batari, actually. This is a this is a, a surface that is pockmarked by acne and by sex and by you know drugs and it, it's something that is is not away from what you need to deal with. It is what you need to deal with. It's the is. That's what he's trying to get at here. But I'm not sure if you're hearing that yet. Maybe you're not supposed to, because. Maybe you're not supposed to hear it. Well, in this context, I do think that there's a gender issue. Mm -hmm. And then there's an issue between all of us as individuals as well. And this, the surface is not as stable in any way at all. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's very, very true. So, um, so, uh, so him laying that out, the whole, that whole kind of description is about us all um, having, a, a, you know, understanding or appreciating the surface in an entirely different way, mm -hmm. and that that's constantly moving and changing. So by the time I walk from this seat to that door, I'll probably change my mind again about mm -hmm. what it is, but it's certainly um, kind of changed. Mm -hmm. just because I heard it. Yes, yes. Lotus, you want to say something? <coughs> I don't know when you, you try to, I just feel very tense. You feel tense? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I was just like, you know, I try to maybe for, you know, but I just feel tense. And, and the tense is what, do you think? I mean the words, you know, because putting words together. Yeah. Yeah. It, it created that that that, that impact. You know, impact. The yeah. Yes. I mean, he's he is going to get. I mean, if we get there tonight, he's going to start developing this in terms of questions of intensity. You know. So I mean, some of these passages have got to have been at least provocative. If you know, if nothing else, you know, make you mad, make you sad, make you something, make you make move you. <laughs> You know, move you to do this intense thing. And he's 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 in, like Francesco. You got up and started painting at one point. What point yeah. did you decide to get up and paint? Why why did I you start mean, standing uh, up? Why did you say close your eyes? So the rebel in you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not going to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why I could concentrate more about what what was it about what what you were saying. So did you do this with your eyes closed? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Dane, what do you think about this? Um, in taking the body and just laying it all out there on the surface with no, no internal organs, no sort of hierarchy, brain, heart, all that other stuff. It's on the on the surface. Saying it, whereas. Where where is dialectics for this? Where is difference for this? Where, where is it? How does it explain this surface which we've got now? It does it doesn't operate with it like that. Yes, and what does that then do for the last four months? <laughs> I hate you for doing difference. Now, what 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 is what does this then? What do you think he's getting at by by putting everything out <coughs> on this thing called a surface or this plane or whatever it is? What's he trying to get at here? Do you think? Is it putting us all, everybody on the same level practically? In terms of they, you know, inhabiting that body or laying it down means everybody has the same quality to, mm -hmm. to start off with us? Yes, my father once gave me great advice when I was going off to do my PhD. I was very nervous, of course, as you would be. And uh, he told me, just remember, everyone has to go to the bathroom. I thought to myself, wow, that's, I wasn't expecting that as a, you know, as a way to deal with the academics, but, and it helped. The variation of it is everyone has clay feet or, you know, whatever, everybody has, you know, but everybody has to go to the bathroom. I thought, you know, that's very interesting. 
you know, it does take you down a peg, you know, even the greatest of the professors, you know, you just, mm, interesting. So, in a certain sense, there is a, an odd form of equality. But this equality isn't the A equals A, you know, the famous A equals A. This is going to be the I equals I. <laughs> okay. Uh, we left it. We left it. Can, I'm just going to put this on, or can you put it in? You think so? Okay, we'll try and see if we can get it back up. <clears throat> What's that? Kind of this kind of tutorial that she did lay out. Yes. Yes. That's what I mean. That's a shame Hannah's not here tonight yeah. because this is precisely about her work. I mean, I I had a um, private discussion with her because I knew I was going to miss that tutorial. What do you think about that that thing that she had laid out? First, as a dice. Were you there? Did you see the dice? Yeah. Did people remember it? Yeah, it was strong. Mm -hmm. It was something that we didn't expect to see. Like, even if it wasn't a real body there, yeah. it was just painting. Yes. It still makes you feel like, why am I watching this? Did I, am I a victim of this scene? Why, yeah. why did I watch that? And it kind of makes you feel guilty of watching that for me, personally. I don't know why. Guilty? Yes. Did you feel embarrassed? Women were just guilty. Like just I mean, guilty. Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody else feel guilty? And now, when you were reading it, actually, I felt like I am again someone that I have to see that scene without me wanting it. To see. Right. So you're going. Yes. I mean, like, yeah. Uh, listening. I wasn't trying to avoid what I was listening. No, 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 right. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is. We're getting closer. Actually, yes. Yeah, there you go. Very good. Uh, we're getting really close to getting this back on the board. Uh, there it is. Thank you so much. Um, we're getting closer to understanding what he is trying to lay out as a feature, as a as a core ingredient, if you want to put it like this, to understanding a this question of art and b the question of material, the materiality of art. If you can, Grace, I'm sorry to make you do this while you're sitting there, uh, but sadly you're in the hot seat. If you can uh, just go to the, the glossary rather than the chapter one. So is it, if, if there's no inside outside, how do you hide? <gasps> very, very good. Ooh. <laughs> He gets bought a drink. <laughs> very, very good. How do you hide if there's no inside or outside? And then this is where I probably get it wrong. Then. And then when he talks about these these sort of irregularities and these, I can't remember the, the words he uses, but the, the, the sort of after three readings, you can't remember the words. <laughs> <laughs> um, Um, but you, you're having to use what's what's around. Um. Yes, if there's no inside or outside, how do you hide? God, that's a tough one. You might have to be bought a drink as well. <laughs> um, okay, if you just scroll down, oh, I think we need to go on the next page. I'm not sure where it is. Uh, it's the great zero whenever we get to it. Actually, yeah, there we go. Okay. Oh, no, that's too far because I, I, I didn't explain yet. Um, the libidinal band scan. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Now, this is what I hope that um, Daniel began to raise, but I'm going to raise it anyway. So you see the first line here. It says, the band which has, most importantly, neither an inside nor an outside. He is going to talk about this as the way in which meaning gets established. And he's going to try and do this, again, uh, outside of this problem of totalizing. Which is why, as you'll see somewhere in there, he starts talking about paganism, uh, or the, the author starts talking about the, the translator. 
So it says here, although the libidinal, libidinal ban allows Leotard to show what is necessarily excluded by representational thinking, it is not to be considered to be descriptively true. since the model would then collapse back into representation or representation. So, so the, the, the challenge that Luke raised against Anastasia, Leotard would come back and say, well, what you've done is now just rewritten it into a representational field. So how does one think outside of representation? The, the, so A, emphasis on think, not on outside not on beyond, but different from representation. Because representation is the thing he's arguing, and many people argue that kills art. Or kills, if not art, at least kills creativity. Something like that. We'll, we'll get back to that. Art, creativity. The libidinal band, or the skin. Now, it, there's a, there's a, uh, a trade-off. Sometimes it's called a band, sometimes it's called an economy, and sometimes it's called a skin. And sometimes it's called the bar, which is number 10 on the thing. So you have a libidinal A, band, B, economy, C, skin, D, bar. And all of those expressions he's, he's playing with so that he, he, he's saying, how can I explain this? So um, you know Mobus strip, right? I'm going to show you again Mobus strip so we're all clear about this. So <clears throat> the thing about a Mobus strip in a three-dimensional, the thing about this piece of paper in a three-dimensional environment is that it has two sides. And that if I can just borrow your pen for a second, and that this if I draw a line, that line will never be on this side. We know this, right? This is, and the whole thing about the libidinal band, sorry, the Mobus strip, rather, which is basically a libidinal band, which is, yeah, is that if you, sorry, so I did, I did a little turn. See that? So I did a little curve. I did like a figure eight curve. Da -da. That's that's what creates. So now we have. In a three-dimensional environment, a one-dimensional object. And the reason we can say it's one-dimensional in this example is because, as you know, we've shown this before. So if I take the pen and I a pencil and I never lift it off, and I I take the pen, and I'll do it like this so you know it's this one, the pencil, and I never lift it off to the thing for that one little moment when I hang up the thing. This is obviously irritating. Anyway, you can see you have to turn it, but you never lift your pen off. So eventually, if we go all the way around. We will see. Oh, <laughs> Obviously, I, there we go. Okay. And if I undo this, we have the line on both sides. Now that can be understood as a libidinal band in the sense that once it's once you understand how this Mobus strip can operate, that how, once you can understand how in a three-dimensional environment you can get a one dimensional environment. You don't have to go outside. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to leave the room. We now have one dimensional environment. That this creates, that this thing is the economy, is the libidinal economy. This, this, and this surface that it creates, whether or not you're, I'm sorry about my inability to do this very well, whether or not you are um, seeing it this wide or this wide, <coughs> this wide, this wide, you know, it doesn't really matter how wide it is. The, the, the width of the surface is determined by what makes up the surface. So, hence, when you, when you cut the body open and you're laying it end to end and you twist it, 
like we do a little Levinmo band, a little Mova strip, you have the entire surface, you have the inside and the outside. So when you understand how a MOBA strip operates, you understand there's no inside or outside to a MOBA strip. But he wants to take that notion and say, but that's true actually of how one understands knowledge sex. It's the surface of the, of, of, of the, of the moment, let's say prior, although there's no before, that's why it's tough. Prior, you know his term postmodernism, and he uses the term. You know, Leotard, came, Leotard is the one that came up with postmodernism, and it's kind of interesting because he says that he's only written three books, even though he's written a million books. He's only written three books. One is Discourse Figured, which we don't do in this class, but we do in the PhD class. One is The Differon, which we also don't do in this class, but it's tough. And one is Live in the Economy. Those are the three books. In fact, he's written a lot of books. And one of the books he's written is on postmodernism, the postmodern condition, which which changed the generations for like 30, 40 years. That's one of the, he doesn't even count that as one of his books. That was because the postmodern condition is a comment on what he's trying to develop here in the Little Bit Economy. He's trying to say that to be postmodern is not to come after modernism, it's what modernism produces when it's not working. And that you need that to create the, the environment in which modernism can actually emerge. We're not yet modern, this is what his argument is. We're not pre-modern and we're not modern. At the moment we're <coughs> postmodern because the thing called modern has created this entity that's gotten away from this problem of modernity and needs to come back and become the libidinal surface for it. Anyway, I'm not sure if I've just lost you there. What's that? But, I mean, I, I take into modernism. And, you take what? Um, going into modernism and saying, well, modernism isn't, is it all it's cracked up to be? It's, um, no, in fact, not only is it not all it's cracked up to be, it hasn't even gotten yeah. to what it's cracked up to be. Yeah, and it's saying to me, in the yeah. uh, utopian. Like, what would you say, I mean, the critique of modernism, it's really. The of beauty, that sort of thing came out, so. yeah. But the critique of modernism is alienation, your yeah. blame for, you know, failures. The individual is, you know, both the purveyor of their own destiny and at the same time a failure for not getting it right. So on and so forth. So, you know, there's a lot of problems with modernism. On the other hand, I would far more want to fight for, uh, you know, equality, social, you know, rights, you know, this kind of thing, which is modern rather than, you know, go back to some pre-modern yeah. or some other form. So, yes, there are a lot of terrible things. And what Leotard is saying, and a lot of these guys are saying, actually, is that the fight for, uh, for really getting equality, for really getting democracy, for really having art flourish, not a type of art, but, but just the flourishing of the imagination, requires that one rethink this, not, not just rethink, but re re-inhabit, become immersed in how a surface operates. So it gets back to your question, Stuart, um, which is how does a surface allow or be in a situation where one can hide in a surface? How do you hide in a surface? So let's continue with this thinking. So he, he gets to the, uh, on the bar, he says, if we imagine the libidinal band as having one surface, a labyrinth, a labyrinthine, and aleatory, then the bar is to be seen as the operator of various disintensifications. So we go back to Clovis's remark that hearing this, there, you know, a lot of the English doesn't make sense because your English is probably, you know, not able, you're not able to hear everything anyway. So what you're hearing are the tones the energies, this is having this kind of ability. So it, it, it creates both an intensity and, a, and an ability to either just become one big intense ball or to be able to locate the various intensities on the band. And so the hiding starts playing around with hide surface, hide, be away from, this relationship to intensity. 
So being intense is required, and that's a feature of love. But knowing how to disintensify without leaving the band is, is crucial for this process. So he says, if we imagine the libidinal band as having one surface, white hot, I mean, he has to throw that in to make sure you realize he's still on the sex side of things. Hot, fire, sexual, sensuous. Then the bar is to be seen as the operator of disintensification, which in slowing down and getting that intensity to begin to not be intense, allows for a displacement, allows for a non-identity allows for something to happen so that the, that the, that the what are called pulsions or drives, and pulsions in, in, in French is, is the, or to leave, is the um, is this notion of the instinct. Uh, but he's trying to say, you have these kind of bubbling, energetic moments going on that are filled with uh, uh, the ego, the id, the, well, not the ego, the id, the, um, the sexual, and he's very uh, committed to having you remember that you all have genitals. Everybody in this room has genitals. Everybody in this room has is involved with their genitals one way or the other. Either they hate them, they love them, they don't use them, they only use them. You know, whatever. There's some relation if you have your genitals. And when you think about that, when you think about the that this is the this is a place of intensification and the way in which it starts to uh, operate as intense, not intense, slowing down, not slowing down, displacing, not displacing. This allows for different, uh, let's say, situations to be set up on the band. And so it's not like the band is just one big butterscotch pudding or sauce. It's not, it's not homogeneous in that sense. It's not, flat, it, it's not like nothing can be on this band. And that's what's odd about the surface. This is an odd surface. This is a surface that isn't normal in any of our third dimensional, three dimensional ways of thinking. Divide later on, he says, um, it is through procedures of exclusion, notably negation and exteriorization, that the bar gives birth to the conceptual process. <coughs> Twisting the band into what Leotard calls the theatrical volume. So he, this is again an attack on dialectics. Dividing up what takes place on the band into a this and a not this, the bar as it cools down accounts for a series of, of conceptual frontiers. And then we lose questions of authentic, alienated, exchangeable, perverse, and so on. So he's trying to get you to think that when there is the attempt to place something on the bar that can make, sorry, place something on the band that can make a bar, and the bar can create the this and the that, this and not this. That will then immediately flip into representation. So it's very easy to, to go exactly into this cooling down period, as he says. Are there any questions somewhere? There must be questions, because I, I, I feel like it's so difficult that I want you to try and get what's being, or at least hear what's being said here. Is the, is the bar a, an obstruction on the surface? An obstruction? Yeah. Or a scar? Y yes, I think a scar is a better way of putting it. And a scar is a better way of putting it. And you do have scars. When I, oh, well, we all have scars. And these scars create the the ability, or let's say the inability, to have the work of mourning happen. Because the scar of, let's say, the mourning makes it impossible, or can make it impossible, to, to let go. Because how do you let go of a scar? This becomes a problem. Now, how do we get back to the hiding bit? Or maybe that's too much of a jump. I was thinking the bar and the, and the band could be the inside and the outside. But there is no inside and outside. There is a substitution of these concepts. Kind of but he's trying not they to work, substitute They work for the same thing, more or less. 
think. He's trying. He's trying to say there's no such thing as it is. Yeah. When you're talking about the libidinal economy, let's put it this way. This is completely wrong, and I'm sorry, world. This is wrong, so don't quote me on it, like in this sense. But when you're thinking of the libidinal economy, think of go into. Does anybody cook? I mean, I don't cook, so this is going to be a really bad example. It's already bad. It's going to continue to it's going to go downhill from here. So you go in, you open a cabinet, and you get out an ingredient. That ingredient, in this case, is the libidinal band. Okay? Okay. That, in that ingredient is your main ingredient for making your food. And without that ingredient, it ain't going to work. Now, it's ridiculous to say you're inside or outside that ingredient. That ingredient just is. But not only is it an important ingredient, as it turns out it's the only ingredient, so it's kind of good for all of us that can't go. <laughs> oh, we need an ingredient, here's the only one. You know. So it is, it's a band that is not going to be inside or outside because it doesn't matter about the inside. It, whether, or not it, whether or not there is an inside and outside, although he's going to go further and say there's not an inside and outside, but forget about whether or not there is one or not one at the moment. Just, just park that to one side and just think in your mind about the laying out of that body with the many bodies end to end and how that can make a surface and how the inside of the body is now the outside of the body and how the outside of the body is now let's say the bottom of the body and now you know so just just try and come up with this band idea where the band is itself kind of like John's uh, weird skin thing that he had upstairs that thing that was hanging like that could be, let's just picture that as a libidinal band. Yeah, that, that there's this kind of uh, amorphous, bloody thing that has, it's, it's, it's not real in the sense that obviously if you did this to a human being, they would die. So it's not real at that level. But what's real is the idea that you're thinking that, okay, just try and conceptualize it as beating, pulsating, orgasming and it's all on the surface because there's no underneath it there's no on top it's all part of the air or what you're saying it's all hitting the air and this is what he's saying is missing in all of the work in all of the disappointments he's come to he's disappointed with the left because they become obsessively moral he's disappointed with the church because they become obsessively um, authoritarian about God. He becomes a, a, a upset with the left, or I said that already, he becomes upset with the, you know, with Hegel and the aesthetic crowd because they leave out this, they make it all too clean. He's saying, you cannot have art without this messy bit, you just can't have it. You have to have the pagan, or whatever you're going to call it, you have to have this kind of visceral, you have to be willing to be cruel. I know that you didn't see that there was a cruelty here. But is there, it, yes? Is it about the rawness and the honesty of this thing? Yes. It's like, it's more tidy, it's really, um, <coughs> well, seeing it as it is in some ways, without trying to, to brush over it and really understanding that rawness of Except you are the it that you're trying mm -hmm. to say. Okay. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so where Stella and Anastasia were correct in, in this sort of sense of being both on the table and looking at the table, learning how to look and see yourself mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, Francesco? No, I'm not. Right. So, yeah. Anybody before we now continue? Grace, do you have anything to say about this? go now back to the opening book part, which is page, actually page three, page two and three. Does everybody have this, or does nobody have it? Does, can you look on, for those that don't have it, can you look on? Does anybody on this slide have it? You can share it there. Apart from looking at there. Okay, so. So he gets into this on page two. He gets into this where I said the question of counting as. Don't urge us to ask it. It's somewhere there. The question of 
quite say that in the middle there. The question, the question of, of can we ask? Don't urge us to ask it. He's okay. So this this book is written as a manifesto, as you probably, and he calls everybody who gets it, you know, us the minimal economist. He wants to form his own little band. I don't mean because he's trying to form a political party or really. He's saying all of us who have nothing in common, that's the us I'm referring to. The community of those who have nothing in common. This is this group. Okay, all of us who have no, no home, and that's our home, that we have no home. You'll get it on the first pass. That's what he's saying here. It's a bit of a conceit, but that's what he's saying. So he says this us that he's referring to, don't ask us, us liberal economists, to try and talk about representation. The question of counting as, don't urge us to ask it. Don't urge us to say, what does this represent? If we look at any of the art pieces in this room, don't ask the question, what does this represent? You'll never get the answer, because it's, it's an idiotic question. The problem is, is that that question is the root of most types of art. In, certainly in modern times, and certainly in, in about the 1600s onward. The question of counting as, don't urge us to ask it, far less to resolve it. It is not a part of the body. Like, what do we mean by body anyway? It's not a part of the body, the organic body, organized with survival as its goal against what excites it to death. So he's saying this is his talking to himself. It's, don't ask us, it's not a part, whatever we've got laid out on the table as our, our own body, also laid out as, our, as, as not our body, but anyway, our body. Don't see the body in this situation as simply something that survives against the odds, or that has this death drive, or has this pleasure drive. Just see this body. Just, he says, it's not a part of the body the organic body, usually understood as that which is organized with survival as its goal, assured against riot and agitation, not a part what, uh, not a part which comes to be substituted for another part, like, for example, the case of this little girl. It's not the political body in that sense. Now, that can be irritating because, you know, I mean, after all, he just talked about a little girl, talked about the labia. He's, in, he's now involved every one of us in this room being pedophilia. That's a problem, I would think. So he's being very political here. He's saying, I'm being, in being political, I'm telling you, don't be political. Here, here's how not to be political, be political. Yeah, so he's got this kind of disjunction going. You gotta be, in, and Kirsten was the first one to point that out. Such a displacement, such displacement whose function is representation, presupposes a unity. First point. And the second point is that unity is understood as only being able to be made different or interesting if it can be transgressed. This is not what art is about. This transgression, this kind of transgression, is not what it's about. It will just create garbage. Art is about forms of transgression or types of transgression, but it's not that kind of transgression. It's not that type of transgression that's going to transgress unity of body. It's a totally different form of transgression. It's the one that transgresses a surface, which says, as surface, there is nowhere to hide. And yet, guess what? You find a place to hide. That's the transgression. So he says, there is no need to begin with transgression. We must go immediately to the very limits of cruelty, perform the dissection of polymorphous perversion, spread out the immense membrane of the libidinal body, in quotes, because it's not a real body. It's like a mobus strip which is quite different than to a frame. The frame of the totality of the unity of something, or the unity of something, creates a frame. This is why in art, 
movements, so many of the movements, particularly under Dada, and, uh, and later on some of the other uh, movements beyond that, broke the frame. There was a, there was a, it literally smashed the frame, get out of the frame. Do, don't work within a frame, out the frame. It made, it is made from the most heterogeneous textures, and it gets a result of various textures. All of these are called zones. You could have said <coughs> dimensions. What if you join a dimension end to end? What does that even mean? It's just wild what he's trying to do, do with hair. But if you're going to give art its due, then give it its due. Realize that it's got the same problems as physics, actually. It's got these mad dimensions that can't be understood sociologically, anthropologically, even politically, and possibly even philosophically, although he leaves it out on that one. All these zones, all these dimensions are joined end to end, already a mad concept. How can you join a dimension end to end? Already crazy. And yet we can kind of begin to think it. Join end to end in a band which has no back to it. A Mobius strip or a Mobius band, which interests us not because it is closed, but because it is one-sided. You go to your cupboard, you take out the libidinal body, the libidinal band. And as soon as you take it out, it envelops you. And you're now in the libidinal band. And if you don't get in the libidinal band, your work is going to not work as hard. It's not going to have that pulsational grit, that, that anger, cruelty, love, passion, these emotions, these senses, these sensations. It's not going to have that. The Mobius band, which is not because, but because it's one-sided, a Mobian skin, but it's a skin that's a weird skin because it doesn't have an underneath, it doesn't have a top, which rather than being smooth is on the contrary, even if this is topologically possible, covered with roughness. So if a surface is covered with roughness, there's got to be places to hide. There's got to be. It's just not logical. Or to say it slightly differently, it's logical, it's just not the logic of a Cartesian logic, of a certain Western law. It's not logical at that level. So that's why he goes to pagan. So he goes to pagan religion for this. You don't have to, you can go to different environments, but he goes to paganism. Corners, creases, cavities. So, so think about it again. So you have a, a surface that is covered with roughness, corners, creases, cavities. Okay, why is that a surface? How is that a surface? Even Deleuze gets into in his work on the fold, he starts talking about how it's the fold that creates in a surface the creases. Even Einstein knows that uh, the, or not even Einstein, Einstein and, and, and Co. And, and Faraday, and this, the, you know, the kind of heroes of the science world, um, show that, uh, the, that time and space is curved, is folded. That's how you get your creases. That's how you get your places to hide. But try and understand what that means. That, that's what we're trying to get at which when it passes on the first turn will be cavities, but perhaps on the second, lumps. So now it sounds like he's gone into a sort of, some sort of psychotic reverie. But as for what turns, what, for what turn the band is on, no one knows nor will know in the eternal turn. So it's like knife in the head. The interminable band with a variety, with variable geometry, for nothing requires an excavation remain concave. Does anybody know what this sentence means? For nothing requires, what does it mean to say that an excavation can remain, con what is an excavation? Digging. Digging. And how do, what is concave? Concave is inward. Inward, right. Okay. So, so a dig, so just like you're showing, a dig goes like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you take your shovel and you throw the stuff out, so you're digging like that. And that creates, what's that thing called? 
concave, good. The concave moment. Now, what's convex? Other way, very good. Okay, nothing is to say that when you've done this and you you got it like so, that it really isn't this, just mm -hmm. upside down. It really could be concave. So you're making a concave with what you've done that. Yes. Well, that's one thing. You could say that when you, you like your, your little mole, you know, like, you know, and you got this little hive here, you know, so you know there's a mole hill, so you get a mole hill, that could be concave. But actually, the thing that's convex could also be concave, or the other way around, the thing that's concave. He says here, there's no reason to say, when you're talking about geometry, if you're talking about actually trying to navigate on the plane, you're not going to be like a lunatic and say, well, actually, you know, the convex thing that is in fact concave, you know, people would say, well, you know, do you know how to walk? I mean, you know, you know, it's crazy. He's saying something else. He's saying that in this realm of the, of physics, let's say, of sexy physics, which might sound like an oxymoron, but in fact, <laughs> he says, for nothing requires that an excavation remain concave. Besides, it is inevitably convex on the second turn, provided it lasts. So you just want to say, okay, you know, again, drugs, what drugs are you on? Because what he's saying here is that when you look at it the first time round, or when you're in it the first time round, because he's not talking about perception as such, he's not talking about your opinion. When you're in it the first time round, it's convex let's, or concave. But as the libidinal economy is a moving, pulsating, alive, entity. The next time you're there, it could be convex or might not be there at all. <clears throat> it's still not got two sides, but only one. Pardon me, only one. Goes on. It is certainly not a libidinal theater then. No density, intensity is running here and there, setting up, escaping without ever being imprisoned. Theatricality and representation, far from having to be taken as libidinal givens, a fortiori, a metaphysical, result from a certain labor. You don't start with it. It results. Representation results from it. The theatricality results from the way in which this, this Mobian surface is operating. Now, I'm going to add one more thing to the mix before we have to break. And that is this question of zero. As I've said a couple of times in the seminar, the big zero, or any zero, the zero is an odd, odd animal. A lot of civilizations don't even have zeros. Zero, on one level, mathematically speaking, in, in your mind, shut your eyes again, in your mind, the zero exists, let's say, and then sprouting off on one side of the zero are positive numbers, one, two, three, four, five, so on. And sprouting off in the other way is negative numbers, negative one, negative two, negative three. Or you could say that the zero is all numbers, and then on the other side are imaginary numbers. But the zero is a placeholder that doesn't really have a place. So it's an odd kind of placeholder. And we know intuitively, because most of you know how to do math, that if you take a zero and you multiply it by any number, it will swallow up the number. It will always remain zero. But that doesn't mean it remains nothing. It remains in this mobus strip. Think of a zero as a mobus strip. So when he talks about the concentrated zero, or the concentratory zero, he's really talking about how this thing goes from being an economy that has everything in it to being the zero. Now, it's this zero that he's going to start developing as a question of alterity or otherness. And I, I just put it in here as a marker for you just to think about the time being. Because in semiotics, and in Lacanian psychoanalysis, and in Martin Buber, I, Thou, and a lot of these other, you know, Levinas, a lot of, lot of the different um, 
theories, even in uh, Judith Butler's work that you, I'm sure your people are familiar with, the notion of the other is this entity that is all, usually a sociological entity. Ethnic, woman, Jew, Muslim, so something, something other, something other than the norm, than the common sense for white male, middle class, or capitalist bourgeois, something. something. This other is wholly other. W H O L L, not H O L Y. W H O is completely different. So he's trying to put clothes, as it were, he's trying to give substance to the Heideggerian notion of difference here. you get nothing else out of this great ephemeral skin, which becomes the great zero, it's a form of alterity that allows one to, if not name, so not make into a concept, not name the passion, the drive, the, the groin, the dirt, the whatever you're going to call it at this point, the senses. It, you're not going to name, he's not trying to name it, so he's not trying to capture it. He's trying to say that there, these things, he's just going to call them pulses or pulsions, basically, or sort of a drive. That this is what is the alterity. And it's this alterity he's begging people not to lose. And it's this alterity he's claiming that you'll lose. He's asking everybody, lose your virginity so that you can maintain charity. By virginity, he means the sterilization, the pure, the innocent. Now, that's only on page three. Okay, so to get through this book and not want to throw yourself off a cliff, all I'm asking you to do is to try and think about what is involved with this great zero when we understand zero being the alterity. <coughs> and how to think about it in relation to intensity. These are the kind of words that he's going to try and use to locate the hidden places. So the intensity that you feel, or that you felt, this was in part allowing you to hide, but allowing you to still be here. And, and as a result, you could be present. And what he's trying to do is ask people, think about how you become present. Because without your presence, the work's not going to happen. So you need, so, hmm. there is a lot more in this, obviously. Would you mind if next week, instead of going into, um, I thought this would take a lot less time than it took. Sorry about that. We didn't get to the dispositive. Um, can I ask you to read the, ephem the ephemeral skin again? Because we're in a third, third pass. Um, is that okay, or do you want to continue? I, 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 I get the feeling, because you're so quiet, you get the feeling that this is like difficult. Or is it that you are bored? Or is it's it difficult? Difficult, okay. <laughs> is it okay that we, we read this again? Mm -hmm. This time, take parts. Like, some of you take the beginning, some of you take the middle, some of you take the end. I sort of did that. <laughs> Beginning, <laughs> middle, end. Work together on it. I don't know, maybe we should separate you two. But, you know. <laughs> but work together on it to see if you can crack it. Just this chapter. Because the whole course is kind of in this chapter. And it goes, we're going to get into Einstein soon enough. And you need to get this because you need to. You need to free yourself of these limits that you're caught up in at the moment. That's my speech.
Okay. <coughs> See you next week.